Welcome to the Artist Work Ethic Podcast. I'm Mike Pilak. I'm a screenwriter and filmmaker who's always looking to maximize my time and potential as I work to break in. In this podcast, I talk to artists of all kinds who have seen success in their fields about their process, habits, and work ethic. Today on the show is Kathleen Gaddy. Kathleen is a two-time Emmy-nominated actor best known for her time on General Hospital, where she's appeared in over 450 episodes in 10 years. She's also starred in Fear the Walking Dead, Flight 462, and has had recurring roles on 24, Arrow, and many more. All right, Kathleen, thank you for coming on with me today. Thank you for having me. This is really cool. So you've been very busy in your career, and, and you've balanced a lot of stuff. You've been on literally hundreds of episodes of General Hospital, while also guest starring and recurring on other shows like Arrow, Fear the Walking Dead, 24. I know it takes a lot of energy and inspiration to handle all of that. Where do you pull that inspiration and energy from? How much time do you have? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll try to make it brief, but in a nutshell, you know, I grew up, my father was a symphony conductor. My mother was an opera singer. The work, eth their work ethic was incredible. You rehearse, you practice, you study. That's how I grew up. It was just normal. That's that's what you do. I wanted to become a ballerina and ballet dancing. I don't know if you've interviewed dancers, but that is the possibly one of the hardest work ethic needs for work ethics. You know, it, there's so much discipline with that and the hours of the physical and the mental, the preparation and rehearsing, and you always have to be in your best and you always have to be prepared. And that was probably the most disciplined training, if you will, that taught me you have to be on point. You know, you always have to be your best. You always have to stand tall, hold yourself, know your material, you know, you know the stuff. And I, I guess I'll, I'll tell the whole story. So when I was like three, I was in my first play in, in school. I, I wrote plays. I directed and produced my own play when I was eight. And then I did a lot of theater in school and I, and I was dancing. So I, I still had the discipline of the dance. Then I grew up after high school, I went to study ballet with a dance company. Um, I, I continued studying acting and singing. And then I went to New York. There was so much discipline in all of this training. And then I did tons of theater in New York. There is no, I, I think personally, people are like, what should I do? You know, I get emails all the time. How do I become famous in three weeks? First of all, I'm not famous. I don't know how that works. Some people know me. I love it. So I appreciate the fans, but it's, it's, I call myself a working actor. That's what I do. I work and you have to work all aspects of your industry, you know, the business. But basically I learned from the theater and I say, I, I, it took me 10 years of studying, working, doing free theater, doing this, you know, this free, that free, but anything just to get the training besides going to school full time to become an actor. Cause it, it is a profession. People are like, well, I'm pretty, I'm going to go to LA and I'll be famous. It's like, well, good for you. Maybe two people out of a million, it happens to, but basically, you have to be prepared. You have to show up. You have to, you know, have talent. You have to not just, well, I, I don't see talent. You can create that. You can work it. You can, um, I don't think I was gifted as a talented actor. I think I've grown into it and work hard. And, and I still watch my performances and still go, oh, cringe. Oh, that wasn't good enough. And still keep working at it. Still keep working at it. Improving the acting. Improving the acting. That's not funny. That was too dramatic. That was too big, too small. So you're always fine tuning. But I say the best thing was the training in, in New York to prepare as an actor. You learn from the other actors, you learn from the audience when you're on point, when you're not. And this is something that I, I, I probably should, I was gonna wait till later and say this, but you respect the writer. You don't change Shakespeare's writing. You respect the material. And I was trained to, not only because it's a respect to the, person who's a writer who has spent years writing and studying it is also a craft, but also because that helps the other actor. If you say, how are you? And they go, thank you, I'm well, in the play is a weak little example, but in, and then you could say the sky is blue. They cannot say, thank you, I'm well. It's just, you know, so you're respecting other actor by helping them and then they help, you know, it's, it's, it's a discipline, it's a respect, it's hard work, but training. So people are like, what do I do to become an actor? Train, 
study, volunteer at a theater, work behind the stage, work in front, work on the stage. If you're doing film or TV, go do student films, go volunteer to do the hair or the makeup, to bring the coffee, to bring the toilet paper, to be on a set, smell it, eat it, drink it, learn it. People want shortcuts and I'm not the right person for that because I don't know a shortcut. I didn't grow up in that. My parents each spent 20, 30 years developing their craft. My father, till he died, he was developing his craft as a conductor. You know, my mother, because she became a wife in the 50s, and at that time, women gave up their career for the husband and the children. But she told me her ethics and the study. And so I grew up learning how hard they worked. And to me, that's normal. So when people show up on a general hospital, I've worked with some great actors. There's some probably general hospital, not to sound egotistical, but they probably had the best actors in town. On a primetime show, you're doing 23, 26 episodes a year. It means you have two weeks to shoot, you know, a couple of scenes. You're doing, you have a couple of weeks to learn your lines here. You're doing 10 episodes a day, maybe three, four or five, if it's not too hard. But it's, it's a factory. We're churning out 250 episodes a year. So there's no time for this, hmm, let me pontificate. Do I want to turn left? Do I want to feel? It's no, you learn it, you go home, you study, you learn your stuff, you show up. There, the actors are. Um, I'm marvel at everybody. Um, for me, I'm, I'm praying I got through it. So it's like, oh, I did another day. I got through my 110 pages. So, but I'm always grateful that that I remembered and I'm on point. But I work my ass off. I stay home and I study and I work. And it's not just to memorize the lines. You know, it's also. What do I want to say? Oh, this is funny. How do I time that? So each moment to make the audience laugh because they deserve it. And when someone writes to me and sends me a message saying, you know, I'm going through chemo and my dog died or my mom died or I'm about to die or, you know, I've had just so many things I've been through in the nine years with this show because it's a family show. It's been on for 59 years. You know, it's a long time. So it touches me when someone says, you know, for an hour, you made me forget about the tr trouble I'm going through. Then I know that all that hard work and the preparing that this is funny, that this is emotional. To me, that's an Oscar or an Emmy, whatever it is. I mean, that means everything. But there are some actors on the show and they're like, oh, they come up in the morning and they're like, oh, I haven't looked at my lines yet. What, am, what is it today? Have you seen, what is the story today? I'm like, you have the respect to the writers, to me, to yourself, to come in on point, be prepared, you know, respect your colleagues and, and help so because we have a lot of work to do, there's no time for improving, and, and people think that they're cleverer than the material, and I think the writers are fantastic. You know, people, the audience is like, no, we want this person with that person, and, you know, so they get mad at the writers sometimes, but it's kind of sweet. I do too. I yell at the TV when my favorite show is like, no, don't kill them, or, you know, whatever it's, but I think... I think like on our, even our show too, there's, you know, there's some amazing actors. And when I get to work with these people, I'm just like, thank God, they're just fantastic. And other people show up and like, what's my script? What do I say? And then they wing it. And it's like, there's no room for winging it. Cause that means I have to wing along with them. And I'm not, you know, it's like, I've learned my lines. I've show up. I, they give you blocking. You go here, then you go there. Then you pick up the cock and then you take it there. Then you put your, and you have like three minutes to learn it. When you're doing a play, you have four weeks five weeks, six weeks to learn. With this movement, I'm picking up a cup. And as I say this line, I give him a cup of, you know, and it makes sense. And your body learns, it's a body language. I forget what they call the term where, you know, your body is a sense of memory. You learn the movement. Muscle memory. The, muscle memory, thank you. So it all works together. But on a soap, there's no time. They're like, okay, you need to pick this up, pick up your drink, say that thing, go over there, take the coat, pick up the gun, shoot him, go there. You know, there's so much action quickly. So it's like, really, now you want to improvise on top of it all. It's another art form. I, I respect the people that are trained like I am. You come in, you know your stuff, you, you've done all this at home, you have learned your lines, you have looked at the script, you know what the material is, you know how you emotionally, how we're going to help each other artistically and emotionally. And it's always exciting when you're open with another actor and they're open to you. That's when the magic happens. I, I love your point of it's, you know, respectful to the writing, to the other actors, and even the whole crew, really. The people hanging the lights don't want to do an 18-hour day either. And there's no time, and, and they want you to get the job done and go home. I mean, it, this is a soap opera. I have never worked on anything as hard as a soap opera, I have to say. I, I, it's probably the hardest thing. But that's only one aspect, I mean, of work ethic. I mean, that's... That's getting to a place where you can maybe get work, where you're prepared. Because they say, what is it, you know, uh, 
5% inspiration and then 95% hard work, whatever the correct expression is, but basically you have to work your ass off. I, I don't know how to make it any more, you know, candy coated, sugar coated. It's a lot of hard work to become a working actor, but a lot of people want to be famous. They want to be wealthy. They want to be celebrities. And I'm like, then create some kind of a, be a influencer, whatever they call it, something, go do a YouTube show, do something where, you know, you're out there. Just don't, don't do selfies at the Grand Canyon and you fall into the Grand Canyon. I mean, you know, this is just some stupid stuff. But I'm just saying, I mean, there are things to become a celebrity. I don't know about that because I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in entertaining people, creating content. I mean, I, there was a time I did a lot of producing and I had my own production company and I produced some movies and some television series and commercials. And and I had a theater. I lived in Hungary and I had a theater and I, and I was really interested about bringing theater from, Hungary was a larger country and the Trianon Treaty in 1918, whatever year it was, they cut it down to like a fifth of its size. So all these neighboring chunks of Hungary were chopped off and given to other countries surrounding it. So I thought it'd be great to have an international theater where neighboring countries that also had Hungarian theater would come and we'd exchange. Anyway, I had those great ideas and started working on that. And we had our first, first couple of productions going. And then I decided to come to Hollywood. And I was 40 years old and people were like, you're going to Hollywood, you're 40. And I was like, yeah, because I was I started coming here like 10 years earlier, but my mom, uh, turns out she was uh, terminally ill. So I, I spent like six and a half months with her and a couple more months after she passed. And your life changes, that kind of a life-changing experience. And so I didn't go to Hollywood just then. I ended up going to Europe for two months and stayed for six years in Hungary and loved every second of it. So, you know, life kind of takes you in different directions too, but I, I did the produce, you know, so you can create your own content. There's so many things you can do to make yourself, like I said, with your iPhone, you can make a movie. There are movies that have been made on iPhones and they're doing great. Just brainstorm with friends and people and, you know, get together. And then there's marketing. That's a whole other subject. So going back to the beginning of your career, when you were first working to break into what we'll call it film and TV, what did your work ethic look like at that point? I mean, you've talked a lot about that, you know, you worked very hard and you, you did the work and worked on your craft. How did you put that all together to kind of form the habits that led you to a break in? That's a really good question. I, I was living, I went to New York to actually, I was initially modeling and dancing and I was going to start ballet and I was studying acting and singing and I injured myself. So I stopped dancing and then I thought, you know what? And I was singing and acting and I thought, okay. And I started doing some musical theater and some stuff like that. And I went, no, you know what? I really, I want to make a living and I want to be taken seriously. And so I just kind of eventually, I studied musical theater and perform and did all that stuff, but I eventually honed in on specifically television and film. I was like, okay. I want to make a living, I want to break in, I want to do well. What, how do I do this? And I've trained and I went, so in New York, I did train and I, and I kept training for years and years, but while I was training and while I, after I finished a couple years of school, but I was still training, still doing tons of theater. I started as we called it. I don't know if you still call it that pounding the pavement, but at the time I literally went door to door to all the casting in, in New York city gave them flyers, pictures. I mean, to me, stapling a picture and resume meant I was furthering my career. And I would sit on the floor in the living room of my 180 square foot mansion in, you know, on the fifth floor walk up in New York City in this little tiny hole in the wall. And I was empowered, self-empowered because I was doing something to wait. I wasn't waiting because I, I really wanted to go to Juilliard. That was my dream. But my parents were like, we don't have the money. We can't send you. And the deal with Juilliard is, at least it was back then and probably still is today. If you come out of that school, there are 10 agents waiting with contracts for you to sign saying, we're going to represent you and you're young and you're finished school and you're talented and you whatever, you're well-trained, you're going to be working. But that didn't happen for me. So I had to work my butt off to break down those doors, get someone to represent me, make the thing. So I, I found my own way and I've always been that way. I've always had to been a pioneer, forge my way because I never, you know, it was never handed to me. And I think that's okay because I like to work for something. So I don't really want anyone to like, you didn't give me something free. It's like, no, my mother always said, Hungarian woman, no free lunch, Kati, no free lunch. And I was like, she's right. You have to work for it. So I would pound the pavement take my pic staple pictures and you know resume, which you don't need anymore, things on the computer. But at the time you spent thousands of dollars of money you didn't have and you would go you know, and here and there. 
I worked in a butcher shop every day as an example. Five, five, five thirty in the morning, I get up, I go to work from like five thirty or six in a butcher shop till two thirty in the afternoon. Two thirty in the afternoon, I go to school, like you know, quarter to three or three o'clock till seven thirty. Seven thirty, I went to the theater, and I worked in the theater. We started at eight o'clock, and I'd finish around ten, eleven, go home, get ready for the next day, study lines, whatever I needed for theaters, you know, prepare, go back to next morning, back to work. This went on for years. So again, more discipline. And in between, I would take my pictures and resumes, go to all the casting places, agencies. If I was doing a play, everyone got a flyer and there were like four or five hundred agents or cast, uh, casting people in, uh, in New York. Let them all know I'm, in a, you know, I'm doing this show, I'm doing that show, I just finished this play, I speak these languages. So every month, that's an, so I pounded the pavement, as we call it. Today you can't do that in LA when I first got there, 20, uh, LA, 23 years ago. I started out by you know driving you around to all the studios. Well, you can't do that anymore. Now you mail it in, and and, and I've been if if you've ever been to a, you know an, an audition or something. I mean, you see, you sit in the waiting room, and they have like mouth boxes of these you no know, mail boxes or like 10, 20, 30, 50 thousand pictures for maybe one role. It was daunting. I didn't even want to see it. To me, it's like I always say, wear your blinders. There is no one else you're competing with except yourself. You cannot compare yourself to anyone because you just sit home and cry and eat. And that's, you know, it's okay for five minutes. And they say, have a pity party, five minutes, move on. There's no time. You've got to focus on your career. It's only you. There's no one else. People are, aren't you afraid of competition? I can't think of that or I'm dead already. You just put on your horse blinders like horses wear and just forge on your own path. So that's what I did. I would take my pictures. I would knock on doors. Hey, I just did this. I just did that. And when I first came to LA, that actually helped. And I, I don't want to get ahead of myself because there's something that happened in New York with all my children. I, I did something else and I kept it up in LA too. I had a flyer and I called it Kathleen Gaddy News Bulletin. And every month I would sit down and I would mail out four or 500 of these to all the people that I had left a picture and resume who probably forgot me five minutes later. But I sent a picture and resume initially and then I would follow up with flyer. Hi, you know, so nice to meet you last month. I'm doing this. I just did a play or come see my play or whatever it was. And I have to tell you this one story. My first break in New York was 1989 and got a phone call from my agent who had, hadn't done too much for me. But anyway, she called and she said, you have an audition for all my children. And she said, it's a recurring role. And she said, and they want to see you tomorrow, whatever it was. And I was like, great. Got the material, got the audition, got all dressed up. Went to the audition, and as soon as I got to the audition, the casting director Joan Dean Checo at the time she holds up a she holds up a piece of paper and she goes, uh, "Hey, do you have a picture and resume? Because all I have is this flyer that you sent. The flyer that I sent, one of the four or five hundred every month that I sent for years, was what got me the audition, was what got me the and I got the part. I remember." This is kind of thumb. I've told this before the story, but it's like, so whoever's heard this, I'm sorry, I'm repeating it, but it just means a lot to me. I was, because back then we didn't have pay, cell phones, we had pay phones. And every 10 feet, I would like get, walking, if I was out of the house, I'd be like calling my, you know, your answering machine. Did I get it? Did I get, you know, I was, and I walked, there was a phone. It was in a, like a big, what do you call it? Construction zone. It looked like a big garbage dump in the middle of Manhattan. And I stopped and I found a phone and I quickly put in my dime, whatever it was, I think it was a dime then. And, and I get this call, you got the job. And I'm burst into tears. My first break, it's like five episode arc with potential for more. And you know, it's like a couple of months worth of work and with, with these actors with Maurice Bernard from General Hospital and and uh, Katie McK McCain. I'm just some great, great act. Michael Knight, who I work with. You know, these are people I'm, I'm still working with on, except for Katie, but she's been there too great actors that were wonderful and you know we had a great great time but i got this call and i just burst into tears and these I remember these big construction guys running over hey hey miss are you okay are you okay i'm like i'm just really happy so you know it just meant so much to know that my work ethic got me that break and it was such a big deal that you know and i said to my agent why didn't you submit me and she said honey they want to drop dead gorgeous and that you ain't 
I didn't know because I didn't see the breakdowns. I didn't know that they wanted Drop Dead Gorgeous or Gorgeous. So I didn't know anything. All I knew was it was a casting director on a show I could possibly work on. And I saw that through my blinders. There's a show. They're all beautiful people. I'm kind of a little funny looking, but maybe somebody will find it in their heart to say, yeah, but she's not a bad actor or she's trained or something. They'd find the beauty in me somehow. Maybe not in my physique or my face, but they'd find some beauty in me. You know, it, it just meant a lot. She said, well, honey, you ain't, you know, dropped it gorgeous. And I thought, I was like, okay, you don't believe me. And I think that's been probably the hardest thing in my career is to have agents or managers believe in me when they're like, well, yeah, but there's, a, you know, 20 people much more attractive than you and younger, and we're going to focus on them. And I'm like, no, focus on me because I have the work ethic to get that job. I will prepare. I will do a good job. And, well, <clears throat> what I'm hearing a, a lot of here is it was persistence and perseverance that brought you over the hump and maybe doing those things that not everyone was going to do. If you're competing with 50,000 people who send out one round of headshots and resumes, but don't do the persistence and the follow-up right. and staying at it, you may not have, you know, you may not have gotten that audition, which changed everything for you. That really opened doors because of that show. I mean, the show end. I mean, my role ended because the people like Maurice, he left and came to LA and the st so our whole storyline ended. But they was like, maybe there's more, but that storyline ended. But I have to flash forward to General Hospital. I met, I came to LA back in um, 1998 after Hungary, the film industry died because of politics and the wall coming down and communism ended. So it was now democracy, capitalism, and they don't know how to make films they didn't back then especially it was a whole new education how to produce something so the industry died for about 10 years and i was like i i had a cookie business a restaurant but i was like no i am and the theater but i am a working actor i need to keep working that's what keeps me alive that's what fl makes my juices flow i mean it's my get, turns my cranks so i was like i gotta i'm gonna give hollywood a chance i came to hollywood and i was lambasted you know by people like you're too old for hollywood you're 40 what are you doing here and i thought Someone needs a mother. Someone needs an aunt. Someone needs a teacher. Okay, I'm not the ingenue. Okay, I'm not, you know. But again, they're like, you're competing with at your age group. These people have been working for 20 years. And they've got an established name. You're unknown. You've been gone for six years off the grid. You worked in New York in theater and you did some soap. We don't know you. So it was hard. So as a beginner actor, I went to and did workshops with 20 year old actors i was like you know going back to to elementary school and you're the 40 year old in the back of the class and these kids are like you know 10 and 12 and they're like who's that old lady in the back of the class it's like i i went back to school so i went to school back literally these workshops and met the casting too i wanted them to get to know me and they're like who are you you know we've never heard of you you've been you know and i told my story i've been in europe for six years and i came back with a hungarian uh, equivalent of a Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actress and these awards and this thing and, uh, you know, leads in, I don't know, eight feature films and 10 movies of the week and television series. I mean, you name it. It just had, it came with a great resume. And then I met with a manager and he said, you can't tell anyone you're in Europe because I think you're a foreigner and you'll never work. So it was, there was so much, you know, they say, don't listen to all the noise. There was so much noise when I came to LA and I was sat crying. I tell you the first three months, I can tell you, I sat crying in my little studio apartment, sobbing. Like I had this beautiful career, 10 million people knew me in Hungary. They respected me and I would have stayed. I was happy working there. Had there been work, I would have stayed. And I still hope there's work one day, you know, to go back and do some more because things have changed here. But initially for years and years, it was nothing. And I, and I just, there was so much noise when I got here, you know, telling, it was so hurtful and nobody cared. And, and I just got negative. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. You can't. So what I did was my work ethic. I'm like, when I, when that happens, I go, I go back to the source, get to the work, do the work. Okay. What's the work? Well, besides reading plays and keeping active and, you know, studying and performing and doing student films. And I wish I started doing that also as a 40 year old after you know 20 years in the business or 15 years i went to do these workshops well i met casting directors and they're like wow that's really cool and you speak languages another important thing i want to be ballet dancer with the bolshoi in in moscow and in, in russia my mother said honey you have to learn russian then if you want to do that so while i was studying ballet i studied russian well that 
extra, you know, that moved me apart from the average actor who was white, American, whatever class, you know, middle age, whatever is something you and 5 billion other people that can play this role. Oh, you speak Russian. Oh, you can do accents. Oh, you speak Hungarian. Well, luckily my parents are that I studied French. I studied Spanish. So I had a good language base that opened the door for lots of work. On 24 is the first lady of Russia on brothers keepers, a Russian cleaning lady on, a, you know, just, it just opened the door because I had that specialty. That was again, like, you know, 23 years ago. So it was different today. They want the real Russian. They have to check your DNA, make sure that, you know, you really are Russian. It's like, I'm Hungarian, it's close enough. I, you know, we speak <laughs> it fluently. So that really changed, but I, I did these workshops and I tell you, I did a workshop with the casting director, Michael, uh, Mark Teschner, Michael, Michael's my husband, Mark Teschner. I met him at one of these workshops and every month I, after I met these people, I kept in touch just like I did 20 years earlier in New York as a student sitting on the floor of my house and, or the apartment, you know, I kept doing that. And I kept sending cards saying, hey, I just did a, a film. I speak this language. I'm, you know, I just did a whatever. I mean, whatever. I just did a play. I still, you know, still did some theater in LA when I first started. And then I realized to me, it wasn't a theater town and the kind of theater I was like, you know, I just do the film and TV, but it was still it was something to talk about. It kept my juices going. It kept my training, kept my chops going. So it was while I'm keeping my chops going, I'm keeping the marketing going. And that's a big thing. We never really learned that in school, marketing. So, and that's such a, you know, a big part, not instead of in addition to training, working, keeping your chops going. So I kept doing that. Would you believe it? Mark Teschner, 14 years later, I get a call to audition for the role of Liesl Obrecht. It's a two day job. You're going to be moving this character from one room to another, You'll, two episodes. Okay. I've been doing two episodes, six episodes, one episode, guest star, go, whatever. Sure. Go in. I audition with a bunch of people. I get the part. It's only a two day role. I leave. I do my job. I show up, learn your lines, be on time, actually be early, not on time early, especially in a place like LA, you're driving or New York, you don't know when you get stuck in the Metro. You don't know in LA, if you're stuck in traffic, always give yourself half an hour, an hour early. So what you sit in your car and you prepare even more, but you always have to be early, be prepared, know your stuff. And again, I have to say this because to me, it's really important. Other people try to sabotage you. There's a lot of noise. It could be your own noise. You're like, Oh, if I'm not pretty enough, I'm not good enough. I'm not, you know, not enough, not enough, not stop. When I go on an audition, I see like 10 other women who look just like me, except they're prettier, they're slimmer, they're younger, you know, whatever, I, all the mind games. I go to the bathroom, I sit in the stall, whether I have to go to the bathroom or not, and I work on my material and I keep my blinders on because people are like, oh, you're not really Russian. You shouldn't be here. I was up for American, um, what's it called? The Americans really good role i did i had to do a, a, a self video because i was filming something in utah i wasn't in la for that and they wanted to see me in spielberg's office and spielberg's it was like huge i went in there and they absolutely loved me and there was this woman i know this russian girl who we've always competed for same things she tried to sabotage me every time we've worked together on films and every time i see her she was like you're not rational what are you doing here you have no business being here and i went i'm going to it's time to go to the bathroom <laughs> When is it the bad? You know, so I keep saying this, but you know, don't let other people just keep your blinders on. It's your path. It's nobody else's. You know, I don't talk. I just see people. I'm like, hi, friendly. I'm polite. I don't ever want to do that to somebody else. We're a team. You know, if it's not me, it's you. If it's not you, it's me. You know, we're in this together. 14 years later, he calls me and I have this audition. And since that, I mean, they liked me and, and I don't want to get into it. I'm just really appreciative, but it's, you know, a few months later, I got a call saying they want you, no contract, but they want you recurring. They're giving you a daughter and they want you back. I was like, what? I was so grateful. And since then, 450 episodes later, if not more by now, you know, it's been a recurring. I come and go. I have done, I was a series regular on the Fear of the Walking Dead Flight 462 and other shows. And I have time to do other things. I come, you know, it's like traveling. So there, it's been a beautiful situation. I've worked with every actor on the show. 
you know, one's more talented than the other. Most people who learn their lines, I love them more than the ones who don't. But, you know, basically it's, it's a really great working um, environment. And as my husband always says, boy, your chops are like, you know, you, you work your ass off. You have to, you have to be ready. So one time I saw Mark, you know, Teshner, he said, wow, that's so proud of you, doing great. And I said, thank you. It's because of you. And he goes, no, it's because you kept after me. You kept reminding me that you speak this language, you speak that language, you did this film, that it's because of you. And, uh, you know, to get the audition and then because of me to keep the job and because he opened the door. But, you know, I had to keep working. And so it's like the work, work, work ethic, it's unfortunately is right of my, this is all I know. I don't know anything else. During your career, when you have been met with a no, which we all have been many times, like what what do you what are you telling yourself to push through that no in it, in addition to getting those blinders on and just pushing forward what's your strategy to to just pull yourself back up and keep going it's hard i mean i, I won't deny i mean that like when i i didn't get that part of the americans it was down to me and that other girl and she got it it was it was painful it, you know it hurts like a an sob what i say you know it, it really hurts but i always say you know spend five minutes have a little pity party sit there and go <gasps> cry feel sorry for yourself eat something yummy and then get back on the wagon get back to work it's like okay there's nothing i can do about it you know you need to kind of you can't just ignore it it's there it happened you're hurt but you can't dwell on it you're gonna you're gonna die what's the point we're here life is short it's a gift you know i've seen enough people die young because they wanted to, because they're ill, kids, I mean, just so many things. It's a gift, it's a blessing that we're allowed to be here, not to get all spiritual or anything, but it really is a blessing that we're here. We get to live, we get to fulfill our dreams if we're lucky. So it's a, it's a we're very fortunate to be in this place where we don't have to work on a farm 20 hours a day unless we want to, you know, it's like, because we have to feed our children. I mean, there's so many things that we are lucky to say, mm, what do I want to do today? Do I want to be an actor? Do I want to be a ballerina? Do I, you know, there's so many choices. So what happens when that I get a big no, and I've had plenty, and I'm sure others have too, and you get so close and you're like, I can taste that job. I, or you have a job and they promise you the moon, that's happened a few times too, and then they pull the rug out from underneath you. And you have, and I'll give an example only because sometimes it's a gift not getting a certain job. I'll say this about a show and, I, and it's not to be show that I'm angry because I'm not, I'm actually grateful the way things worked out, but I, I got the pilot on Arrow. We did that back in 2012 and it was back in Victoria. It was a great role. It was just a guest star, but it was the guest star for, I don't know if you saw it, but I was playing Raisa, the maid. It wasn't the maid, it was the house mistress to at the Green Arrow, the mastermind, you know, I mean, initially it was just a, a smaller thing and, but they were like, oh my God, we love you. We are going to build this role. We are going to make this. Th it was also back in Victoria where I grew up in British Columbia, near Vancouver, Canada. So they were filming in Vancouver and in Victoria. And to me, we, I got to stay in this hotel where I had waitressed 20 years earlier with my dreams of, of becoming somebody dancer, model, actress, whatever it was. And I was waitressing there and I slipped and fell there and I hurt my back and that ended my acting, my dance career, which was great, thank God. But at the time my life was over again, how do you get over that? My life was over. But in time, it took, it took time to probably about a year or two that I could turn back and look and say, thank God that happened because the age of 21 or 22, my career would be over. I mean, as a dancer, if I injured myself or if I was 30, you know, life ballet is a very short career. So, you know, things happen for reasons. And again, not to sound too hippy dippy or everything, but, but at the time we don't always know what's the best thing for us, but Arrow just quickly to finish the story. So I got this part and it was just a guest starring one episode and pilot and it's beautiful. And now I'm in this suite at the same hotel where I was schlepping, you know, coffee and donuts for somebody, whatever it was. And here's, they had fixed it. It was a gorgeous hotel. And it's just, now I'm on the other side, smoking big cigars. And it was fantastic. The respect and the, oh, and the work. And they said, we have this huge, we're going to, you know what? We love you so much. We are going to develop this. You can become the house mistress and you're going to be the mastermind, the Russian brain with him. And you can, anyway, they did market research. They didn't care about the Russian mastermind middle-aged lady. So they killed that whole thing. I was devastated. 
I was back in my home. It was in town. It was a success for me to come back there as a successful actor, staying in this beautiful hotel where I had slept, you know. So it was such a huge disappointment. But I had just gotten married. Actually, I was about to get married the next month, which was a big deal for me, getting married later in life. But it was somebody I'm absolutely crazy about. And we have, thank God, a beautiful marriage. But it was it would have taken me away from him. A. B. I got those first couple of days on General Hospital. And that just blew into, you know, so you lose something, you gain something. You know, at the time it hurt like a son of a bitch. I was suffering. I mean, I, you know, even to this day, I remember, you know, the sense that PTSD was like, ah, the pain of that. But you know what? They brought me back for five or six more episodes a couple of years ago. It was fun to see them again. It was great to be with them all. But, you know, I, I was over that big pain because it was like, didn't work. You know, it's market research. They did the numbers and you have to, under I'm, as a producer and who had a production company, I understand that you have to do what's going to bring in the money. And the story is of him, the action, the romance, the sex, the violence, the crime, the killing, you know, all that stuff. Not like, let's mess the mind together as a Russian, you know, that, that wasn't interesting, but it hurt. It really hurt. So I say, have your little pity party, feel sorry for yourself, pull up your socks and say, okay, this didn't work but something else is waiting for me. You know, they say when God closes one door, the 27 windows open. So yeah, pull up your socks and get up there and have a little ice cream, feel a little sorry for yourself, then be done and move on. There's just no time in life. Is there anything that you want to plug or talk about before we go? I'm writing a cookbook. I had a restaurant when I was in Hungary and, and I grew up in a Hungarian home. So it was a lot of cooking and food. And, you know, like I said, if you, you want to wall over two minutes, eat something yummy and then go, you know, go back to your nutrition and working out and all that stuff. And that's another thing, you know, physical working out. I and mean, there's just so many elements, take care of yourself. So you feel good. You're always on, at your best, you know, and if you, if you're, if you're going through some heartache, go out for a good hike, go for a good walk, you know, just kind of let that wash, wash away. Um, I, I do these zoom cooking shows with a company called fantasy events, coastal entertainment, fantasy events. You can see it on my, I have a um, Twitter and um, Instagram at, at Gatti Tweets, G-A-T-I Tweets. So I'm always like promoting it on Facebook or something. My shows every couple of months. I, and uh, that's that's kind of what I'm doing right now in between the general hospital stuff. And there's a couple of other things brewing. There was a Hallmark film. I That was a, another was a sad one. It was like I got, got cast, was ready to fly to Vancouver, but they needed 14 day quarantine and there's only 11 days. So uh -huh. they had to recast quickly and I was heartbroken. But you know, things like, stuff like that happens so you just sit there bake something make something fun get together with friends laugh watch some funny shows you know how to heal but right now that's what i'm doing i've got a cooking show i'm working on a cookbook hopefully be out next year but writing takes time that's what you said you're right that's hard to sit down and really you know focus on that and fix it but it's a work in progress i'm like you know what so it's two years later. I mean, there's no, I don't want to put more pressure on myself than I already am under, you know, with working in the industry. It's a very high pressure kind of thing. So I do want to say one thing I, uh, I mentioned about, you learn from other people. I worked with Robin Williams a couple of times and his work, it's speaking of work ethic, he, unfortunately he's not here anymore to tell about his work ethic and he's too humble, he never would. But I remember my first movie I did with him was called Moscow and the Hudson. I was a dancer. I had a silent bit. They called it. We worked three days. We were dancing. But he, as the star, he was a busboy on the movie. I don't know if you ever saw it. He had to pick up like a 30-pound plastic tray of, of uh, dishes and move it over to, you know, something in this restaurant at the Odessa in, 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 um, in Coney Island. And, and they said, you know, um, Robin, please go to your, you know, trailer, wherever your room, we're going to have a stand in come. He said, no, I'm, and he was playing this for in Russia. No, I do it myself. He stayed in character. He did the accent 18 times. I counted. He carried this 30 pound big plastic tray, the movement from this table, 20 feet away to help the lighting crew. And I'm just new actor starting out going, wow. Again, not that I needed to learn work ethic, but to see it in action that kind of thing that's what's work ethic if you want to talk about work ethic that's what that is you put in every ounce of energy to do your craft whatever that is music dance singing acting plumber whatever you put your heart and soul into it because it will show and people will give you the work if you put your you know your effort into it awesome well thank you so much for talking to me today 
<laughs> talking at you. I'm sorry, I talked for an hour. <laughs> Thank you for having me. And you know, I hope I, I don't know. I, I love to inspire other people, but I also feel like I scare them because not, you know, people don't really want to do all that. But I think you know, if you have a passion, you've got to follow your passion, but put the work into it. Thank you so much for listening today. Please subscribe to the Artist Work Ethic Podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts, and please rate and review the show. Follow us on Instagram at The Artist's Work Ethic and check out theartistsworkethic.com.